August 1998, deep in the bowels of the British Museum, work began on building an extension to the erotic literature and artifacts section. While the curator was clearing some shelves, he found a locked leather portmanteau, wedged between a collection of early Byzantine pornographic Texas home care bathroom tiles <laughs> and a first edition of Janet and John Go Brass Rubbing. <laughs> portmanteau turned out to have once belonged to a Dr. John H. Watson. And hidden under his surgical instruments were several volumes of hitherto unpublished memoirs, recounting his adventures with none other than Sherlock Holmes. The BBC now brings you the newly discovered case book of Sherlock Holmes. Snappy title, eh? Here begins the latest volume of the Journal of Dr. John H. Watson. Though it is somewhat distracting trying to write in the middle of this blasted traffic. That's better. <laughs> One of the most bizarre cases I ever became embroiled in, due to my association and friendship with Sherlock Holmes, the brilliant detective, master of disguise and toffee-nosed ponce, <laughs> was known as the case of the clockwork fiend. It began one spring morning in the year 1889. I was attending to my morning ablutions at 221B Baker Street, and Holmes was reading the newspaper. Watson? Uh, yes, Holmes? Listen to this. Uh, can it wait? I'm attending to my morning toilet. Yes, so you said in your narrative. Uh, get Mrs. Hudson to summon the plumber if it won't flush. <laughs> no, 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 no. My ablutions. Ooh. I wish to try some of that new eau de cologne my nephew sent me. Ah, yes. It's the one I use. Curious. Don't you mean Kouros? Not where I squirt it, no, but... <laughs> Never mind that. Just look at the headlines in this morning's daily slag. Oscar Wilde ate my hamster. Mm. <laughs> A most interesting euphemism. Gutter press, Holmes. Uh, let me peruse over its pages. You'll do no such thing. I've got to give it back. Mm. I see how newly installed speaking tube is working. <laughs> See who it is, Watson. Hello? That's you, Dr. Watson. It is, Mrs. Hudson. I've got Inspector Lestrade from Scotland Yard here. He wishes to see Mr. Holmes. Lestrade? Oh, send him up, Mrs. Hudson. Send him up and prepare elevenses for three. But it's only half past ten. Shall I wait half an hour and then bring him up? How would you like a punch in the mouth, Mrs. Hudson? <laughs> oh, get off with you, Doctor. I'm a married woman. <laughs> Come in, Lestrade. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Morning, Lestrade. I must say you got up here rather quickly. It's three flights. Oh, I slid up the banisters. <laughs> yeah. I can see your cheeks are flushed now. <laughs> State your business, Lestrade. Does the name Bert Quasimodo ring any bells? <laughs> no. Why? I've got a body I'd like you to look at. Honestly, Inspector, you're such a flirt, aren't you? <laughs> A dead body in Brixton. Capital. We'll take a look as soon as we've had our elevenses, eh, Watson? No time for elevenses, gents. This won't wait. Driver, take us to Brixton with all speed. Lestrade, we're still in my apartments on the second floor. <laughs> At least wait until we get out into the street. You always have a smart-ass answer to everything, don't you, Mr. Holmes? Oh, come along. We're wasting time. At last we have another case to get our teeth into. My word, he's keen, isn't he? Don't worry, he'll be back in a thrice. How do you know? He hasn't got his trousers on yet. <laughs> and so, dear reader of this journal, duly trousered and abluted, I accompanied Holmes and Inspector Lestrade downstairs to the police vehicle parked outside the front entrance of 221B Baker Street. Come along, gentlemen. Time is precious. All in. Constable Villeneuve, drive with all speed to 297 Horsemeat Terrace, Brixton. <laughs> We're here, gents. Best thing we ever did buying that racehorse. Well done, Schumacher. So, where's this body, then? In the bathroom. It's four floors up, I'm afraid. No problem. We can get there via this music link. Here's the bathroom, gents, and there's the body. Good heavens. It's standing up. Is it? <laughs> I can't quite see from this angle. The corpse, Holmes. Oh. The corpse. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. What is it? You smell, Holmes. There's no need to get personal, Watson. <laughs> Just because I didn't have time for my morning toilet. No, 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 Holmes. You smell under his nose. Ah, yes. Yes, I say what you mean. Kurari. 
The pygmy poison, if I'm not mistaken. That's what I thought. And look what he's holding in his hand. <laughs> it's just a pair of moustache twirlers. Clockwork moustache twirlers, Inspector. The very latest in labor-saving devices. You wind it thus. Holmes, that was his finger. <laughs> Rigor mortis has set in. Damn, I'm still wearing my reading glasses. You're... You'll have to sew it back on, Watson. At first, we assumed he'd had a heart seizure while waxing his moustache. Then, under that tin of wax in his other hand, we found this newspaper cutting taken from the advertising section of the Times. Here you are. Tonight at Lambeth Town Hall, a most illuminating lecture with accompanying lantern slides entitled The Borneo Experience, and live narration is spoken from the mouth by that most eminent of explorers... Orinoco Quills. The Lambeth Town Hall is only around the corner. I think it would be worth attending this lecture, don't ah, you? Alas, we're too late. The tonight in question was April the 14th last week. Oh, botheration. Here, yeah, what's your language, Doctor? I'm a policeman. I'm sorry, Lestard, sorry. Apology <laughs> accepted. Have either of you gentlemen heard of this Professor Orinoco Quills? I have to admit a total unfamiliarity with the name, but he shouldn't be too difficult to track down. In the meantime, I'd like to take a sample of this wax back to my lodgings for analysis. Lestrade, I trust a police surgeon has been summoned to attend to this poor man. Uh, Dr. Bramwell will be here as soon as she completes her duties at the poor hospital. <laughs> Dr. Bramwell? Your police surgeon is a war... a war... a war... Oh, a war. come on, Holmes, spit it out. You know what a woman is. Of course I do, you damn fool. They're the chappies with the high voices and the low-slung mumps. <laughs> Or in Mrs. Hudson's case, very low slung yes. mumps. Yes. You said it, Watson. She's the only person I know who can put a shine on her carpet slippers as she walks. <laughs> this is no time for music hall jokes. No, of course it is. <laughs> Inspector, you can't possibly allow a member of the female persuasion to examine this body. Dash it all, he's in his braces. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll do it for my usual fee. Very well, Dr. Watson, you're on. Thank you. Start work, Watson. We'd better get him downstairs. The number 35 omnibus stops outside in three minutes' time. We'll take him on that. Mr. Holmes, how much longer is that body going to be laid out on my dining table? It's dripping all down my best damask. Oh, stop witchering, woman. Watson is carrying out an essential post-mortem of Scotland Yard. Well, you could at least take his foot out of his soup tureen. Oh, I wondered why his body temperature was so unusually high for a corpse. Have you come to any conclusions yet? Uh, only that he definitely died of curare poisoning. And I'm sure when you've analysed the moustache wax, we'll surmise how it was administered. I already have. You don't mean... Yes, Watson. It seems the poor man twirled himself to death. <laughs> oh, I say, who'd have thought it? Mrs. Hudson, do leave that alone. It's evidence. Well, I've never seen one on a dead man before. <laughs> Not close up, anyway. I'm surprised it hasn't dropped off. It's only his monocle. <laughs> Go and do something useful, like strangling a street urchin or, or blackleading the brasses or whatever you domestics do to while away the time. Well, I'll start preparing your supper. I've got a nice haunch of venison simmering on the stove. I'm afraid we're dining out tonight, Mrs. Hudson. Are we? Where? Basingstoke. A gastronomic destination that doesn't readily spring to mind, I grant you. But, according to the society column of this morning's Times, Lord and Lady Fark are holding... <laughs> I'll repeat their names again. Don't you think, Watson? I think it's worth it. Yes, I think it worth it. <laughs> Lord and Lady Fark are hosting an evening of musical delights and cultural edification at their stately home, Fark Hall. <laughs> Entertainment to be provided by Hortense Crippin, mezzo-soprano, accompanied by Beauregard Crush on the pianoforte. And wait for this. An illuminating lecture with accompanying lantern slides entitled The Borneo Experience. Orinoco Quills. Excellent deduction, Watson. Perhaps he might help us unlock the mystery of Bert Quasimodo's demise. Well, and for dessert, there's kumquat sorbet with melon balls and fan wafers. Followed by mint creams and some of my best Colombian. Oh, really? Don't get excited. You drink it, not shove it up your nose. <laughs> yes, well, like I told you, we won't be dining here tonight. Oh, well, I'll just open a tin of pilchards then. Me and Mr. Rary can have them. Mr. Rary? Tom Rary. He's a Scotchman who's just moved in next door. He's ever so nice. A real gentleman. He has the decency to wear something under his kilt. I know I'm going to regret asking this, Mrs. Hudson. But how on earth do you know that? I was talking to him in the front part of this morning and I had me patent leather shoes on. 
look down at the reflection yes, in them and I could yes, see yes, right Yes, 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 all right, yes. I get the picture. I knew I shouldn't have asked. Oh, well, I suppose I shall have to wear my best bib and tucker for this do at Fark Hall. But of course... The cream of London society will be there. Would you like me to run an hot iron over your dicky, Mr. Yeah. Holmes? <laughs> Not after the last time, Mrs. Hudson. It turned brown. Now, <laughs> come, Watson, we have some preparations to make. What about the stiff on my dining table? You deal with it, woman. Put him out the back. The dustman come on Tuesday. <laughs> I still don't see why we had to wear these ridiculous disguises, Holmes. With so many luminaries present, there's every chance of my being recognized. Hence, my portrayal of a German aristocrat. And you, my trusty equerry. Oh, dear. Our evenings at the damned Israeli amateur players haven't gone to waste, have they? Here we are. Remember, Watson, play your part with zeal and watch and listen for any clue. Very well. Ring the doorbell. Yes. Good evening, sirs. I am Schmuck, the butler. Please come in. Count Heinrich von Schleppentickel at your service, Inks. And this is my trusty equerry, Herr Peace. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. I am your acquaintance, most pleased to be making. Where is the nurse? You will be excusing my chum. He is the greedy fat guts, you know. <laughs> Gentlemen, I bid you welcome. I am Lady Ambrosia Falk. I don't recall sending you an invitation to my little soiree. Forgive me for goose-stepping into your most sumptuous home unannounced. <laughs> but I'm being afraid that we are portcullis crashers at your knees up. And pardon me for our disheveled appearance. We have been most active at the front. <laughs> uh, of course. <laughs> but you have just missed the most edifying recital by Hortense Crippin. I am beside myself with grief to hear that. And I am beside him also. Yeah. So where is Lord Fark, Lady Fark? Lord Fark has a little quirk, I'm afraid. Does he? Well, you know what they say, size isn't important. <laughs> Montague has a penchant for paltry two dinners parlour maids. He's probably in the pantry with one of the little trollops right now. But no doubt, when he has sated his lust, he will return to us. In the meantime, can schmuck get you a drink. You are most kind. I will have a gin and two tonic. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have... all right. The guests are getting stroppy. And I will have schnapps with a cherry in it, please. And I'll have another glass of my usual schmuck. Yes, milady. That's a gin and tonic, schnapps with a cherry in it, and a pint of old peculiar. <laughs> We will have them in the drawing room. Professor Quills is about to commence his lantern slide lecture. Come, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Before I show this penultimate slide, I would request that ladies of a nervous disposition avert their gaze, as it is of a somewhat explicit nature. <gasps> as you can see, my assistant, Dr. Oscar Golightly, had just been bitten by a deadly Borneo member. And as our expedition photographer exposed the picture, I was in the process of sucking the poison out. Oh. Oh. And finally, this is a picture of me being taken away by the Borneo police for committing an act of gross impropriety. <laughs> Fortunately, the matter was cleared up when the tribesmen displayed the offending snake, now quite dead, and a large bribe had changed hands. And that concludes the first half of my lecture. Thank you. There's something familiar about Professor Orinoco Quills. I'm sure I've made his acquaintance before. I shall engage him in conversation to see if I can pick up any clues. Are you enjoying yourself, Count von Schlappentickel? Uh, nein, nein, Lady Park. I was just checking my loose change there. <laughs> Tell me, uh, have you located your wayward hobby yet? No, I have not. The brandy little pillock is probably still getting his end away below stairs somewhere. <laughs> but enough of him. Your trusty equerry informs me that you have a musical bent. That is, I'm secret between me and my piano tuner. <laughs> yeah, he comes in twice a week to service your uprights. Isn't that so, Count? There will be no needing to gild the lily, Mouth Almighty. Oh, may I? May I prevail upon you to entertain us, dear man? Perhaps with a German folk song? Uh, but of course, the pleasure is all yours. Pianist, you will play! 
But I was only, only six months old. My mother and my party too. They didn't know what to feed me on. They were both in a red stew. They thought of this, they thought of that. A little bit of old control. I said, pop down to the old cook shop. I know what'll make me grow. Boiled beef and cows. Boiled beef and cows. That's the stuff your army care. Keeps you fat and makes you bad. Don't live like vegetarians. On food they get to pass. From boy to night, blow out your kite and boil. They clapped. <laughs> They're the shard music lovers. And for my first encore, I am likely to render asunder. I'm a kind of dickly called... I am sorry, Count. There is no time for another song. But it the was professor... going well. Yes, but the professor is ready to commence the second half of his magic lantern lecture. Ah, knickers. Oh, okay. well. <laughs> another time, perhaps. Come here, please. Let us go to the pictures. Yavo! Psst. What is that? I am having a puncture in my rubber ring. <laughs> Holmes, it's me, Lestrade. Lestrade. We found another body. Good Lord. In Pimlico this time, and a murder of a particularly hyenas nature. Then we must dispatch ourselves with all speed to the scene of the crime. And this is the exact position of the body as you discovered it, outside this open door on the landing? That is correct, sir. And this is your lodging house, Mrs... Puse. Hilda Puse. This is my lodging house, yes. And you definitely are the police. Of course we are. I showed you my papers when you admitted us. Well, I was wondering why one of you's wearing a dress and the other two are in German uniforms. We've just <laughs> been to a lodge meeting, if you oh. must. <laughs> that explains it. Poor Mr. Bowker. Who could have done such a dastardly thing? Oh, indeed. Tell me, when Mr. Bowker was alive, did he always have three nostrils? Good Lord, no. Just the two. One on each side, like the rest of us. A body with three nostrils? My God, it breaks all the rules of medical science. This is a real challenge, gentlemen. I wonder. I think a search of his rooms will provide the solution as to the nature of his demise. Mrs. Puce, did Mr. Bowker receive a package through the post shortly before he dropped off the... Uh, died? That he did. How clever of you. A gift I've been blessed with, dear lady. Let us search his rooms. What exactly are you looking for, Mr. Holmes? I shall answer your question as soon as I've examined the contents of his waste paper basket. Ah, yes. This is what I was looking for. Brown waxed parcel paper. Addressed to Ebenezer Balker. Uh, this address, written in a flowery hand. Green ink. Hmm. A faint aroma of lavender. <laughs> Let's search the escritoire. The what? That thing in the corner with bow legs and drawers. No, no, not oh. Mrs. Puce. <laughs> Clarkson Rose, 1938. <laughs> Not Mrs. Puce, the writing desk. I thought I'd just slip that one in before you did, Watson. Though. I wouldn't stoop so low. Let me see now. Ah, ah, this might interest you, Holmes. It most certainly does. Well done, Watson. It's just a receipt. Not just a receipt, my dear Inspector. Look where it's from. The Acme Patent Clockwork and Electric Paraphernalia Company. Who sent to Mr. Bowker, at the same time requesting the payment of two guineas, one labor-saving device known as the Wonder Dynamo-powered nose picker. Yes. Here's his checkbook. And look, yes. the last stub was written out to the Acme Patent Clockwork and Electric Paraphernalia Company. So, he'd already paid out for his own demise before unwittingly carrying it out. He must have called from his bed to the landing where Mrs. Puce found him. What makes you think he killed himself at his bed? Where else would one indulge in such a private practice as nostril mining, eh? <laughs> I should find the proof under his bed. No, that's not it, no. <laughs> Here it is, gentlemen. The instrument of death. The Acme Bogey Master. <laughs> And so, back at our lodgings in Baker Street, Holmes put the hideous contraption through its paces. <laughs> yes, as I thought. <laughs> oh, yeah. This bogey master doesn't work like the others. It's been doctored to operate anti-clockwise, you see, and at a much higher speed than the late world statutory rulings. Yes, so what you're saying is... Poor Ebenezer Bowker picked his nose to death. <laughs> wow. What fiendish brain could have invented such a devilish device? The same fiendish brain that invented the whizzy whisker moustache twirlers 
And the nifty naval belly button fluff remover. The nifty naval belly button fluff yeah, remover? I just said that, yes. It's another novelty item available through this company. How do you know? Before we left Fark Hall, I took the liberty of surreptitiously removing one of the advertising plates that had just been projected by Professor Quill's magic lantern. I still have it here, in my trouser pocket. By Jove, yes. It's an advertisement for the Acme Patent Clockwork and Electric Paraphernalia Company. Offering for purchase a number of items including the moustache twirlers, the nose picker and a belly button fluff remover. My bet is that last savoury little item will be the weapon of death for some unfortunate soul who's written to box number 347, Mount Pleasant. Dear reader of this journal, Holmes, as usual, was right. Lestrade arrived at our chambers in a most agitated state. He was under pressure from his superiors to wrap up the case. Mr. Holmes, have you made any progress in your investigations? Fark Hall. <laughs> You knew it had come in the end, didn't you? <laughs> you disappoint me, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Pray let me continue, Lestrade. Fark Hall holds the key to this mystery. Of that I am certain. While Watson was doing that last bit of narration from his journal, I took a growler cab to Mount Pleasant Post Office, where I ascertained that the box number replies were to be forwarded on to an address in Basingstoke, namely, the lodge house at the main gate of Fark Hall. Well, I never. I don't doubt it, Inspector. Fortunately, I did. The person who registered the box number was a gentleman by the name of Ray Timor. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Helen, damnation. What is it, Mrs. Hudson? There's a telegram just arrived for you, Mr. Holmes. Well, bring it up, woman. Oh, I can't do that. I'm seeing to Mr. Rary's tea. Mr. Rary. I told you before, he's the nice Scotch gentleman what's just moved in next door. 221A. Was he an asthmatic? <laughs> no, he said he'd give me a tune on his bagpipes if I prepared him one of my specialities, Agis on Crute. <laughs> so if you want your telegram, you'll have to come down for it. I have a better idea. Blow it up your pipe. Do what? It's only three floors. Big puff. Yes, that's what I've often said about you. <laughs> Court, Dr. Watson. Yes, you shouldn't have had your mouth open. Did you get it all right? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Good job I didn't ask you to suck. The whole of my study would have ended up in the cellar. He sucked. Oh, Mr. Rary, you are a caution. Uh, what's in the telegram, Holmes? The confirmation of my suspicions. Did you know that Bert Quasimodo and Ebenezer Balker were inventors? Go on. Not only that, but Bert Quasimodo invented the whizzy whisker clockwork moustache twirlers and Ebenezer Balker, the wonder dynamo-powered nose picker. You mean they were killed by their own invention? Precisely. Just think yourself lucky, Watson, that you didn't invent a novelty suppository inserter. <laughs> Thank you, Holmes. Oh. It's that damn woman again. No, no, Mr. Holmes, that was my mobile. Oh. <laughs> The mobile speaking tube. Now, that is a novelty. Uh, hello? Lestrade here? Oh, yes, Constable Brownlow. Really? Where? Right. Good work, Constable. Thank you. But... Well, Mr. Holmes, it seems you were right. Oh. <laughs> Could have fooled me, yes. A third body has been found in Putney, in his bed, and clutching an electric belly button fluff remover. Good grief. Cause of death? Curare poisoning injected into the navel. And was the victim's name Septimus Tremble? My word, does nothing escape that alert brain of yours? <laughs> Is Dale Winton Butch? <laughs> Septimus Tremble was the third name mentioned on this telegram. The inventor of the aforementioned fluff remover. Poor Mr. Tremble defluffed himself to death. But why have these people been killed by their own inventions? That's what I intend to find out. I shall go to Park Hall right away. Incognito, of course. Step aside, please, while I go behind the screen to try on my disguise. <laughs> well, do you think I would pass as the Dowager Dimpler Wool Pudding? Oh, bravo, Holmes. You'll carry it off to perfection, won't she, Lestrade? Well, I'm truly taken aback, Mr. Holmes, and that's a fact. Then I must dispatch myself with all speed to... Enter... Excuse the intrusion, but I thought that I... Look, Sir Mussy, Mr. Holmes, what are you doing all dolled up like a vicar's cheap tart? 
Do you recognise me, Mrs. Hudson? Of course I do. I know you like the back of me hand, which, incidentally, I've just given Mr. Tom Rary a taste of on account of the randy old git trying it on with me. <laughs> Inspector, you'll find him asleep on the kitchen table on account of my having just slipped him a mickey, if you'll pardon the repetition. Well, me saying the words on account twice in the same speech, that is. Good God, woman, what are you chantering on about? Arrest our neighbour? What for? Insanity, perhaps, if he tried it on with you. You do want your arch enemy safely under lock and key, I suppose, Mr. Mouth Almighty. Arch enemy, explain yourself, woman. You mentioned earlier a man called Ray Timmer, the bloke what registered the box number you were talking about. You've been listening in on the speaking tube again, haven't you? I've told you before to keep the stopper in your end. Uh, what a... <laughs> What about this Ray Timor, Mrs. Hudson? Well, it's an anagram, isn't it? Of Tom Rary, of course. Yeah, excellent, Watson. I wondered how long it would take you to work that one out. Oh, get off. You didn't have a clue that none of you... Like you didn't have a clue that Ray Timor and Tom Rary are both anagrams of Moriarty. What? You mean Moriarty? Holmes's archest of enemies was actually residing at 221A Baker Street? The audacity of the man. By thunder, he must have come to and returned to his lodgings next door. Quick, we must stop him. You're right, I can't stand that tune, I tell you. Daft old twazzers. Come out, Moriarty, we know you're in there. Well done, Watson, so much for the element of surprise. <laughs> That's enough pratting about, let's break the door down. Uh, uh. Oh, where is he? There's nobody here. But there is this wax cylinder of bagpipe music playing. <laughs> and there's a note inside it. What does this say, Holmes? You won't catch me that easily, Holmes. Yarboo sucks to you. Yours affectionately, Professor Moriarty, arch-villain of this parish. P.S. If you play the other side of this wax cylinder, I will explain all. That swine, he's got away with it again. At least we foiled his devilish plan, whatever it was. The wax cylinder will tell us that. Oh, never mind. I'll put the kettle on and make us a nice cup of tea. And so, dear reader of this journal, over tea and fairy cakes, we listened to the gloating voice of Professor Moriarty explaining his fiendish plan. It seems the professor had stolen the patents of the inventions and was advertising them in his own emporium. The inventors had got wind of this and sent away for their own creations under the pretext of being ordinary customers. Moriarty, aware of the sources of these patents, had to silence them by doctoring the articles before dispatching them to his victims. His method of attracting new customers was to tour the country with his magic lantern under the guise of Orinoco Quills. Mm, Orinoco Quills, which is, of course, an anagram of... Um, Watson, uh, yes? they're rapidly losing the will to live. <laughs> You know what time it is? Uh, ah. Ah. Pass me my Stradivarius bow. You don't mean... Exactly. Smack bodies. <laughs> that was the newly discovered case book of Sherlock Holmes. The part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Royston Hudd, Dr. Watson by Mr. Christopher Emmett, and Mrs. Hudson and other feminine characters were depicted by Miss June Whitfield. The portrayal of Inspector Lestrade and a multitude of other masculine characters was rendered by Mr. Geoffrey Holland. At the pianoforte was Mr. Ian Smith. The dialogue was scribed by Mr. Anthony Hare. And the entire extravaganza was produced by Mr. Christopher Neal.